Who are you? My name is Susie Boniface. I'm a reporter, columnist, journalist, I suppose you call me. And where are you from? Um, I was, I'm from the UK. I was born in Kent, which is the little corner that's nearest to France. Um, and I've worked in local and national papers for 27 years. And you've been doing a lot of reporting on atomic veterans. How did you get into it and why? And do you even remember? I think I remember <laughs> how I got into it. Um, in 2002, it was the 50th anniversary of the first ever bomb test that Britain had, Operation Hurricane. Um, and I was, that year I started as a reporter in, uh, I started as a reporter for the Sunday Mirror. Um, and the way I heard it, the story that I was told was that uh, our columnist at the time is a chap called Richard Stott. Now he used to be a legendary newspaper editor. He's the only person to have edited two newspapers twice in Fleet Street. And back in the 80s, when the nuclear test veterans first started coming forward and telling their stories, he was uh, the editor of the People and the Sunday Mirror and really pushed their stories. Um, he called them the babies of the bomb. And he was part of, sort of this forefront of a campaign for justice for them. After the 80s, it sort of died away. But Richard still cared. And in 2002, he rang up my then editor and said, what are you doing for the anniversary? And the version I heard was that she said, what anniversary? And he sort of chewed her out and said, you've got to do something for the veterans. And so she got another reporter in the office, not me. She got someone else to sort of do this huge, big piece. Uh, we went back and revisited all the um, veterans they had interviewed in the 80s to see what had happened to their children and their grandchildren. And they found that statistically there was a huge number of problems with those children. They, they ran it past statisticians. They did big front page, big pieces in the paper. Now, I was a reporter there at the time. My name's not in any of those pieces. I think I might have done one or two of the case studies. I'm not sure. My first byline appears in the paper on a nuclear test story in 2005. Um, Did you know anything about nuclear testing? I didn't know anything about nuclear testing at the time. Did you know about Hiroshima and Nagasaki? I knew about Hiroshima and Nagasaki. When I was a reporter in Plymouth on a local paper, someone came into the office one day with a story, a first-person account from a priest of the blast at Hiroshima, I think it was. And I read about it and was horrified by it. And I'd grown up in the 80s, so I knew about the Cold War and, you know, the, the, the regular sort of threats of nuclear annihilation, stuff like that. I knew that, you know, if there was a nuclear war, the rats and the cockroaches become giants, things like that. Um, but I did have a bit of an in because, firstly, I, I quite enjoyed the, the radiation aspect of science at school. I got it. I didn't get much else, but I got what radiation was and how it worked. And also biology. Um, and my dad, who's an engineer, fortunately for me, was, uh, he was an engineer on the old renowned class nuclear submarines which were built in Scotland in the 60s. And he went and had a contract to go and work on them when he was trying to save up money to marry my mum. And he was just a civilian engineer. But one of the things he helped develop was uh, a special membrane between the primary and the secondary reactor circuit that allowed heat to cross, but not radiation, which allows the steam to then turn turbines and power the boat. And so he would tell me that they had to reinvent how to do this because the Americans wouldn't tell them how the submarines worked. It was a secret. But what they had to do was they would have to design a way that make it work and then show it to the Americans. And the Americans would say, oh, yes, now that, that appears to be correct. Or that's even better than we were doing it, for example. So I, he knows a bit about radiation. I knew a bit about radiation. Um, and because I'd, I'd also worked as a defence reporter in Plymouth, so I knew a bit about the Ministry of Defence and how it worked and the services and so on, and veterans and some of their issues. So when I got asked, sort of early 2000s, to take over the nuclear test veteran story, it just got thrown at me one day. You know, the reporter who did the, the 2002 thing had been had retired from the paper at that time, and so it was like, Boniface, do this. And um, it just sort of hooked me. and. It doesn't take long when you're speaking to a test veteran or a widow or a descendant to realise there's something amiss. So, you know, the first time you speak to someone and they say, well, I sat there and I watched a bomb go off and I put my hands over my eyes and I saw the bones through my hands and there's this big blast and then afterwards I was ill with this, that and the other. And you think, oh God, that sounds awful, but pff, who knows? And then the second time and the third time and the fourth time and the fifth time and then you really do start to realise that there's something going on here. Um, and the other thing that probably made me uh, the nuclear test veteran reporter, if you like, is that I'm very, very, very stubborn and I've got a really strong, uh, purit not puritanical, I've got a very strong morality radar and 
if something's wrong, I just, I hate it. And because my dad's an engineer, I'm raised to think if something's wrong, you have to fix it. And there's always a way to fix it. But you don't just give up. You don't just throw it in the bin. You don't just ignore it. You fix it. Um, so combining all that stuff together, I suppose, just made me, from the Ministry of Defence's point of view, the worst possible person to be reporting on the nuclear test veterans. Do you remember what your feelings were the first time you read one of the reports? I mean, obviously it had an effect on you, but do you, was it more just... I don't remember the first report I wrote. I don't remember my feelings about it. I can remember different veterans over the years and the impact they had. So I can remember very clearly speaking to a chap um, in his bungalow, I think it was in Lincolnshire, with his wife. And he was speaking through a, a tube in his throat. So it sounded you know, like Stephen Hawking because it had his tongue removed because he had esophageal cancer. And he told me that in the street that he was in, his whole squadron, his former mates, kind of all live around him. And most of them had had their tongues removed. And I can remember probably the most devastating one was I spoke to a chap called Barry Cox, who had been a hairdresser on Christmas Island. And after some of the blast had happened, he was always cutting people's hair and obviously inhaled various bits of servicemen's hair who had been there during the test. Anyway, he was, um, pros he was going after the Ministry of Defence for a war pension. And he had a horrible type of cancer. I can't remember what it was now. Um, and he had been applying for a war pension. He knew he was dying, but he wanted it for his wife, for Anna and for their children to, to give them a little bit of security after he'd gone. They weren't a mega rich family. And so he had a, a big hearing for his war pension. Um, he had appealed it because they'd refused him first time. And he got himself literally off his deathbed to go and appear at this hearing. Uh, I think he told me in advance that he was going. He rang up the office probably. Uh, and then I found out that it had been adjourned again. And what had happened was uh, the Ministry of Defence, despite knowing the state that Barry was in, had stood up and said, well, we haven't read the papers. You need to give us an adjournment. So we decide this at some future date, months down the line. And Barry had stood up and said to the tribunal judge and the MOD lawyers that were there, he said, you do know I'm dying, don't you? And they said, we can't help it. You've got an adjournment. The barrier went home and died a few days later. And I remember speaking to him on his deathbed and it was a really weird sort of three-way interview because I was in the, on the phone in the office in Canary Wharf in London. His widow was on the other end, his wife, sorry, Anna. And Barry was in bed and he couldn't speak very clearly. So Anna was translating, telling him what I, my questions were and she was sort of translating and telling me what his answers were because she could hear more clearly than me. And he was telling me about all this. And you know, it's so infuriating that anybody can treat another human being so badly, dismissively, to not bother reading the papers, to not think that someone who's got off their deathbed needs a decision now. So that was making me cross anyway. Um, but then Anna came on right at the end of the conversation, <laughs> right at the end of the conversation. And she said, uh, Barry says, don't let them get away with it. And don't give up. So, um, I mean, how can you ignore someone who says something like that to you when it's, you know, one of their last things they're going to get to say? And I've had that so many times from veterans since. It's that first one that really sticks, though. Um, Especially since they were promised to be taken care of. These were servicemen. They were working for their country. And some of them were national service. Some of them signed up. Um, and it's very easy now to look at it and say well we didn't know what we know now about radiation and no we didn't know as much as we do now but the reason we know as much as we do now is because of what happened to these guys there were studies done uh, on things that they were exposed to they were used in experiments we've got the documentary evidence of that we know that america was doing the same to its servicemen at the same time um, and we also know that they knew full well there would be genetic hazards to the servicemen um, scientists knew in 1927 that there was genetic damage caused as a result of radiation. They knew in 1947 at Los Alamos that um, the nuclear blasts were causing huge amounts of alpha fallout and contaminating ships and crew and everything else after Operation Crossroads. Uh, they knew in the British government, they lied to other governments, they did not tell their servicemen. So the safety briefings that they gave the men were 
don't look directly at it. Sit down, cover your eyes. Um, they gave them some flash protection, cotton hoods and, and suits, but no proper radiation suits. They reserved those for the scientists who went into the forward area. But of course, the scientists were driven into the forward areas by servicemen who were wearing shorts and boots. And they came out of the forward area. Maybe they got decontaminated, maybe they didn't. Some of them report having showers and some of them didn't. But they went and played football on the beach. They went fishing for crayfish. They had a barbecue on their day off. They swam in the lagoons. They lived on that island using uh, drinking water that had been made from desalinated seawater for up to a year because some of the tests got delayed and had to be repeated. So you can't possibly say, even my COD knowledge, GCSE level knowledge of radiation and biology says that that wasn't safe, that there was a risk. And the argument is, as far as I can see, only on how much of a risk it was. Was it a big risk, a massive risk or a smaller risk? The Ministry of Defence's line is that there was no risk, that it was perfectly safe. And that just doesn't stack up with logic, with science, with fact, or the evidence of my own ears and eyes when I sit down and speak to the veterans. It's, you've only got to spend some time listening to them to know there's something amiss. And there's a, there's a phenomenon at work, whether it is because they've all been poisoned by radiation, or whether it is they're all suffering a mass delusion, or whether it is they've all been poisoned by something else other than radiation, whatever it might be, something has happened to them. And it's either mass paranoia, mass radiation poisoning, or mass something else. But they share the symptoms with uh, indigenous Australians in Aust uh, around the sites of the original first tests. They share the signs with people in Kazakhstan who had who were there when there were Russian atomic blasts. They share the symptoms with people in Nevada, the downwinders, the civilians. Uh, they share it with the Marshallese Islanders and people in the South Pacific, people at Christmas Island. So, and in the Sahara. And in the Sahara. And whatever has happened to them has happened to all these people on five continents over decades. And the only thing they all have in common is they were present at a nuclear test. So what else is it if it's not that? The other thing that's really sad is it just didn't affect them. Talk about that. You mean the people who ordered the... Oh yes, the family. I mean, we'll, get, we'll go back and we'll revisit the uh, um, radiation thing because one of the saddest things that I always hear is they always by the line, they didn't know what they were doing, which is total nonsense. Mm. They knew exactly what they were doing. Mm. Just read Stafford Warren stuff. But talk about their families. That's, yeah. that's to me, is just, you're a, you're a mother. One of the um, most inspiring people I met in all my reporting this was a woman called Shirley Denson, who was the wife of an RAF pilot called Eric. And he had been ordered to fly through the mushroom cloud of the Grapple Y bomb. Now, Shirley was a force of nature. She was indefatigable. Any time that I just, you know, had, was doing other stuff and thinking about other things, she'd phone me up and say, what are we doing next, dearie? Susie, love, where are we? Uh, and she would hassle me and she would hassle loads of other people. When she got in to see the Secretary of State for Defence in 2018, she said, ah, now, you're the man who killed my husband. You know, she, she would do whatever it took to rock people back on their heels and get justice. And she helped a lot of other widows. And she had four children with Eric, two of them born or conceived after he returned from the tests. Uh, and from my quick calculation and, and their explanations of what's wrong with them, those children, is mostly missing an extra teeth and spinal deformities, but um, something like 30 odd percent of Eric's children, descendants, grandchildren, great grandchildren, he's got now as well, have got some kind of birth defect. 30 percent? It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's horrific. But it's, it's things like uh, um, something that's slightly wrong with one of your internal organs that doesn't kill you, but may mean you have lots of hospital visits as a child. It's things like um, an extra set of teeth, a couple of teeth that come through when they, you've already had your adult teeth through. So it's nothing that's going to kill you, but it's definitely weird. And it's something that makes that whole family concerned about every child that comes along. And Shirley always referred to herself as Fertile Myrtle because she'd had lots of children and all her children had lots of children. So there were lots of them. Anyway, long story short, 
Um, one of the things that, that Shirley would say to me was that Eric, who was, he signed, he wasn't national service, he signed up to serve his country. He was an RAF ace. He retired as a squadron leader. He was one of the best they had. And he loved his job. He was normally doing radar runs on the, along the Iron Curtain, spooking the Americans by getting under their radar and stuff. He loved doing that kind of thing. Um, and Shirley, uh, I, up to the last time I saw her, she always had a lovely scarf draped around her neck, like she just got out of the squadron leader's MG. You know, she was, she was the money. But um, one of the things she always said to me was that Eric would always have done it. Even if he'd known it was an experiment and we had documents that proved he was used in an experiment and deliberately exposed. Um, had he known, he would still have done it because he felt it was important enough to serve his country and that the threat from Soviet Russia and nuclear war was important enough that it needed him to do what he did. But, she said, he would never have let me have the babies afterwards. And that's the thing. It's the fact that it didn't just affect the servicemen. It wasn't just the people that were there who were exposed to something and you know they're, they're dying and they're, they're just moaning about something that was a normal part of service life. It was weird, it was unusual, it was devastating and it's, they've brought it home with them. And one of the things the servicemen, I think they suffer from, the ones I've spoken to, is a sense of guilt. And the mothers too, to some extent, that they've passed this on. Because there was public awareness at the time that radiation was a bad thing. That's why we needed it in a weapon. You know, if, if radiation is safe and harmless, according to the Ministry of Defence's kind of argument, then why is it a weapon if it's so cool? Um, we needed it because it was devastating and because it was terrifying. And they did bring some of that fear home with them and they've given it to their families. And there are children and grandchildren being born now and I know I'm a mum, when you, when, you, when you have your scans and when you have the baby, you count all the fingers and toes and want everything to be perfect and nothing to go wrong. Um, and that's bad enough for most of us, but they've got this extra weight. And the only way I can describe it is whole families, whole generations of families with a black cloud hanging over them that is not clearing. And it just needs some daylight shone on it. And that would clear. I mean, you can't take the radiation out of them if that's what's happened, if that's what's responsible for it. But you can shine a light on it. And you can make it easier to understand and you can give them the information they need when they make their own decisions about whether to have children or what risks they face. Um, and they deserve that because they weren't the ones who, who signed up for what happened. They want the truth. They want, they want the truth. They deserve the truth. Um, it's not just a case of wanting the truth either. I think the truth now, it's so long ago, it's, it's hard to pin it down. Some veterans' uh, memories are shaky. Some of them, you know, their veterans firm up when they speak to each other. Uh, a lawyer could pick holes in some of it. Um, and the, the people who ordered the tests and who wrote the reports, most of them are long gone. So we're never gonna get to the full truth now. But what we can do is shine a light on what's happened since. So since those guys came home, what has the Ministry of Defence done? What science has established? What has happened to their families? We can establish all those truths. We know there's paperwork from the 60s onwards in, inside the Ministry of Defence, I've got some of it, showing that they were saying, no, you, your, your brother flew through a mushroom cloud, he was fine. And then 40 years later, they admit, oh, well, yes, OK, maybe they were probably exposed to something more than we were expecting. Um, so we know they have denials. We know that those denials fall through. We know there's been a degree of back covering, shall we say. Um, I don't think there's been a, a conspiracy. And I don't think if there was that anyone involved in that original conspiracy would still be alive. But... We can certainly upend the bins and see what's in there and the people who are still alive and who are still suffering and are still wondering if they're suffering deserve to know whether those fears are well grounded or not. What would you like to see happen? What needs to happen? I would like, oh God, I would like the Ministry of Defence to be able to assess itself and scrutinise itself and not leave it up to me. I would like our government and our state and all states around the world to be able to look at their own past and say, well, that wasn't ideal. And perhaps we should think about fixing it. Um, if something's broken, you fix it. You don't shuffle it away. You don't hide it under the carpet. You have to repair it. And 
that's what democracy demands. It's what normal, natural human justice demands. Um, the Ministry of Defence should open its records, its archives, because we don't use these weapons anymore. We rent our nuclear weapons from the US and they're entirely different to the things that we detonated in the 50s and 60s. Um, that information could, in theory, you know, help a terrorist build their own sort of dirty bomb or something, and we can redact the bits that would help them. But those archives need to be opened fully. The stuff I've seen is bad enough, and I haven't seen the stuff that's hidden in the basement. So those archives need to be opened. Research needs to be done on them, and research needs to be done on the children and the grandchildren. The men who are at the test have never had their rates of sterility analysed at all. Um, they've had cancer and some blood disorders analysed, but radiation causes random effects. It doesn't do the same thing to everybody. And so you just have a lot of people with a lot of different things wrong with them. And the scientists say, well, there's nothing significant that's, that's jumping out at me. The fact is that these were men who were you know, in, in the 1950s were considered A1 fit. They were the healthiest men in the country and they were 18, 19, 20 years old. And they've now had four or five different types of cancer. That's weird. You know, the argument that, uh, for example, the government studies say that because they have a generally higher life expectancy than the rest of the population, that there's nothing wrong with them. No. The fact is, it's the quality of that life expectancy. I know one veteran who's had 200 different kinds of skin cancer removed from his head and neck. He has had decades in and out of hospital. Now, in the government studies, he will count as one veteran with one cancer. Uh, and he isn't. He has had the kind of cancer that when Hugh Jackman gets a little basal cell carcinoma on his nose, it goes on Instagram, makes headlines around the world. This guy's had 200 cut off his head. Um, there are women who've had multiple, ten, a dozen miscarriages and they're not at early stages, all of them, and those women have still cried on my shoulder when I ask them about them, when they're in their 70s and 80s. Um, this is grief and trauma and pain and a changed life experience from what it ought to have been for thousands and thousands of people. And it's been going on too long. It needs to be sorted. There needs to be an inquiry. There needs to be those archives released. Um, there needs to be research into the children. There needs to be a medal at the very least, because it's, it's just a tiny bit of tin and it doesn't mean much to anybody. My granddad would toss about his medals that he won in the war. He put them in an envelope in a drawer. I was the only one who was interested in them. But um, they deserve to have something to hold in their hand and they deserve to get it from the Queen because she was 1952 and the first bomb went off. I remember speaking to some veterans from Operation Hurricane who said when we went out the king was on the throne when we came back it was his daughter. The reason that she has had a stable, safe, productive uh, reign for 70 years which she's celebrating this year in a platinum jubilee is because of what these men did in before she even took the throne and they deserve to have their acknowledgement and thanks from their country and from her. So that's what we want this year, is a medal. And then you get into compensation and everything else. Um, the MOD doesn't want to do a single bit of that because if you give them a medal, then you start talking about loads of other stuff. And if you give our veterans compensation, then all the, the Commonwealth veterans who are there from Canada, from Australia, from New Zealand, from Fiji, they all start coming along and wanting their pound of flesh as well. So the Ministry of Defence can see a big bill and doesn't want to pay it. But this is the same organisation that will spend a billion pounds on a spanner. So I don't have any sympathy for that whatsoever. This is a debt our country owes and we have to pay it. It's as simple as that. Great. Um, so you know that this uh, video that I'm putting together for Alan and them will be shown in Vienna for the UN yeah. conference. What's the big message? I mean, if, if you were going to talk to if you were going to talk to people um, and tell, I mean, because one of the things like we've talked about is why should they care, and what's the big message to look out for that you know what I'm saying? This is a global thing. It's not just you know. I mean, these guys. But is there something deeper that you can say that's just my message to the UN and anybody who's watching this 
it's not up to me to tell you what to do, but I can only speak um, by summing up what the veterans I've spoken to over the years have said to me. Um, some of them were pro-nuclear weapons, some of them weren't. Some of them were pro-nuclear energy and some of them weren't. They would all tell you, no matter what, that these weapons should never ever be fired. I would say, if you're never going to fire a weapon, then you shouldn't have them. Um, nuclear power, fission, fusion are fabulous things and we need to understand them, but we must protect humans from it. The, we know that in fruit flies, for example, genetic mutations will be seen in descendants for 500 years, for 20, gen or, sorry, for 20 generations of fruit flies, which if that translates into humans is 500 years. Um, and it, it doesn't water down the generations. The, birth, the test veterans have a rate of 10 times the normal rate of birth defects in their children. It's eight times in their grandchildren. It continues on. And you don't know uh, who's got something that's in their genes that you, you wouldn't necessarily want to get passed on, and nor do they. Um, we don't need to treat them as a special case or as sort of a, you know, someone separate to us, but we need to listen to their experiences. And if the people closest to the nuclear weapons are telling you what they're like, you have to listen to them because they're the ones who know. What the rest of us deal with is theory. It's the theoretical idea of someone being hurt. It's the theoretical idea of the geopolitical power of having these weapons. I can understand the need to have the weapons, but if I was the Prime Minister uh, and you had to sit down and write that letter to the the nuclear submarine commanders on day one as to how to respond in the event of a nuclear attack, my answer would always be, don't ever fire a nuclear weapon. It's too risky. It's too damaging to too many people. And it doesn't just hurt the other guy. It hurts your own guys. It hurts the planet. It hurts all life, all vegetation, all animals. That's why they are a weapon. If they weren't capable of causing genetic damage on a mass scale to all living life, we wouldn't have developed these weapons at all. That's why we developed them. And having them is therefore always going to be dangerous. There must be a way that humans are better than our, our worst instincts that came after the Second World War. We must be better than that. We must be in a process of learning and repairing whatever has gone wrong before. And the veterans would tell you, whatever you do at the United Nations, you must encourage all governments that have nuclear weapons to never, ever fire them. And in the long run, to get rid of every single one of them. They would not want you to, to have them in an ideal world. And an ideal world is what we're supposed to be building. It's what the United Nations is for, isn't it? That was excellent. Okay. Is there anything else you want to say? You think you've done it all? <sighs> You're under your time, so you get everything um, said. Yeah. I would say in the 20 odd years that I've been reporting on nuclear test veterans, I have to go to the Ministry of Defence a lot and to the government for a response. And the response is always to protect themselves. And it's ridiculous because the governments that are responsible for what happened are long gone. And they are of multiple parties. You can't blame Labour or the Tories or one side or the other. It's everybody for decades. And when you go to the government today, whoever's in power, they should be able to look at what happened in the past and say, well, that bit was good and that bit was bad and we can defend this bit. We don't want to defend that anymore. They should be able to analyse themselves. And instead, when you are, go to the state and ask for a right of reply, they protect themselves. They protect the state. They protect the system. And that's a system that shouldn't be protected. That's how corruption seeps in. That's how um, cover-ups happen when the people matter less than the system. And as someone who has sat and heard all the stories of the people that are affected by this, who have been battling the system on their own for, in some cases, 60, 70 years, 
and in most cases for 30 or so. That cannot be allowed to continue. When the state has done something wrong, the state must recognise it and respond, apologise, make reparation. That is the sign of a healthy, functioning, good state. Whichever kind of party is in power, that's how the state should operate. Um, the fact that the British government for decades has responded by shuffling the paperwork is abhorrent, it's disgusting, it's immoral. And that's why I want the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom to do what I have done for 20 years and to sit down and look these veterans in the eye and hear their stories for himself. And I want everyone at the United Nations to do the same. Because if I am enraged and tearful as a result of listening to what they have to say, then you should be too. Because I can't fix it. The United Nations can fix it. The Prime Minister of the United Kingdom can fix it. The President of the United States can fix it. The leaders of China and Russia and Australia, they can fix it. But they've got to want to fix it. And the only way that you can convince anyone of that is to listen to what the veterans and their wives and their children have to say. Because there's no way, there's no way on earth you could listen to these people and still think they're making it up or that they're mistaken. It's impossible. So, two more things. How many articles do you think you've written about it? <sighs> well, <clears throat> I don't know how many articles I've written about it. I could probably do a quick count. It's a few thousand. Okay, and, and you've been really fortunate that the Daily Mirror has supported you, right? The Daily Mirror um, has been amazing. I was a staff reporter there for 10 years and um, I remember, I can remember the first time I wrote, one of the first times I wrote a story about the nuclear test, one of the sub-editors, who obviously are the brains of the newspaper and the encyclopedias of the newspaper, came over to me, and I was in my mid-twenties or something, and he came over to me and said, do you have any fucking idea what you're talking about? And he said, you put this down as an atom bomb. And I went, yes. And he said, it was a hydrogen bomb. And I went, what? <laughs> And I had to ring my dad and go, what the fuck is the difference between an A-bomb and an H-bomb? And you know, explain yield and kilotons and millitons, and everything else. And um, so the mirror has been filled with people who, it's a kind of newspaper that uh, is quite collegiate and it, it inspires a fair bit of loyalty in its staff. So there are people who work there who've been there for 30, 40 years. There are people there now in top levels who were there when Richard Stock was the editor. And... They're the ones who gave the task to me and now I'm freelance but I'm still doing what I've always done which is ringing up the back bench, ringing up the subs, ringing up the news desk going why isn't that story in the paper? Why aren't you doing more with it? Why is that only a nib? Why can't I make it a page lead? And I get responses from them going what's the problem with an A-bomb or an H-bomb? I don't understand and I have to explain to the subs now the difference between atomic and hydrogen weapons um, which I'm quite happy to do at length of course. Uh, but occasionally I get an email from one of the old hands who says, do you know what, Richard Stott, I'll be glad we're still doing this. And you wouldn't get that at any other newspaper. It's only the Daily Mirror that has that commitment to the campaign. I've tried as a freelance, I've tried taking it to other papers because I know that um, the more people that read it and know about it, the better for the campaign. But no other newspaper would ever campaign in the way that the Mirror has. Um, even if there's a really good story, they're only going to do it as a page lead and they're going to forget about it and move on, same as they did in the 80s. The Mirror has stuck with it since 1985 or so and I am pretty confident they will stick with it until the end. And if they don't, I would obviously rip them a new one because I insist they did. Who owns the Mirror? Nobody owns the Mirror. The Mirror is owned by shareholders. Oh, it's cool. um, So it's pension funds and, and whoever. I could own a piece of the Mirror if I it's wanted to. It's not Rupert Murdoch. We don't have a proprietor. We're owned by whoever goes and buys a stake in us. Well, now that you're more relaxed when you first sat down, tell us who you are and what you do. <laughs> uh, my name is Susie Boniface. I'm a journalist. And for the past 20 years, I've been reporting on Britain's nuclear test veterans. Thank you very much. Is that better? Great.